dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we just thank you so much uh, for who you are, and uh, Father, uh, for being a God who just pays attention, Lord, thank you for the miracles that you still do today. Um, Father, thank you for your miraculous healing in Bill, Bill Marsh Jr.'s life. Uh, thank you for guiding us through each day and, and taking care of our every little need. Father, thank you for taking care of the big things that we face. And Father, I just pray that we would be a people that choose to praise you like the psalmist did in Psalm 34, uh, that your, your praise and your glory would, would ever be on our lips and just something that we want to talk about all the time. Because Lord, you're worth it. You, you, uh, Father, we owe all to you as we just sang. And Lord, a simple way of doing that is just praising you for who you are for just how you love us and take care of us. So, Lord, thank you for this time, and I do pray for Pastor Ben um, as he uh, has a message prepared for us this morning. Lord, I pray that the words of that message would uh, fall on tender hearts, hearts that are willing to receive it and be corrected and be changed by it. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. This time the kids may be dismissed for junior church. For our scripture reading this morning, if you'll open up your Bibles, uh, if you were ahead of me here and looked in your, your uh, bulletin there and you jumped straight into Mark, keep your finger there, but we're going to be turning to a different passage for our scripture reading. Uh, so please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, the Mark passage, uh, uh, Pastor Ben will be teaching out of that, but he wanted me to read this other verse that... Uh, goes right in line with the theme of his message here. Galatians 5, verse 17, just a single verse, but a very powerful one. Galatians 5, 17 reads this way, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be able to gather together in this building, Lord. Uh, we understand that this building is just that. It's just a building, and the church is the people inside of it, Lord. And so we're grateful for, for the opportunity to be able to fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, and lift each other up. And, Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to, to be able to sit under the teaching of your word. We pray for Pastor Ben as he come in, comes and delivers this message that you've laid upon his heart um, Lord, this is such a crucial topic for us in today's day and age, and so we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be moving uh, in this building, Lord, and in the hearts of these people so that we can be an effective ministry for you in this world. We say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, yeah, so like Pastor Craig said last week, he is up at Frontier School of the Bible. He's going to be doing their, it's what they call special lectures, but it's like a week off from normal classes, and they take that week to go through an entire book of the Bible. So like Pastor Craig has been doing for us on Sundays, he's been going through the book of Ephesians. He's essentially going to go through the entire book in one week. Um, with them and so I know he would appreciate prayers first of all because I think it's like it's like over 15 hours of teaching or something along those lines it's a lot of teaching so just that his voice would hold up um, but also I know it's it was for me at least a great time to you know take off from homework and whatever else we were doing to really focus um, and so I know for me it meant a lot and helped me grow a lot so just prayer that um, all the students listening would uh, also be growing in that way um, so with that being said, I have the opportunity to share with you guys today, and I'm pretty um, excited about that and thankful for that. So before we get started, um, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you uh, for the fact that we can look into it and learn about um, the way that you design life to be lived, really, and that we don't have to be just wandering around uh, in the dark. I just pray that you'd give me the words to speak and 
everyone including me, that we just be focused on what your word says and that we've learned from it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so growing up, I went through a lot of different school systems. I grew up, I was born on the East Coast. I moved to Japan and Hong Kong and then back to Colorado. Well, not back to, I never lived there before, but my parents did. <laughs> so we moved back there. And throughout that time, I was, I went through a lot of school systems. I was homeschooled from like first or kindergarten or whatever through fifth. And I actually kind of redid fifth because I was a year ahead, but the Japanese school I was a part of, which is a Japanese speaking public school, um, they didn't like that. So I moved back. And so I did fifth grade again through a little bit of ninth grade in a Japanese speaking public school. Then my high school years, I did two years at an English speaking international school in Hong Kong and two years at a public school in Colorado. And while school systems are typically good at, you know, tracking a student's progress if they're going through that school system. A lot of times, changing school systems constantly can leave people kind of lost as to where you are actually at. And especially when you're going from a Japanese public school where they speak Japanese to an English school, like where they speak you know, English and it's kind of based on the American system, like they were completely lost. And I was misplaced in almost every class um, I was a part of. So, in a Japanese school, they teach Algebra 2, which is considered like a junior class. Um, here, they teach that in eighth grade. And so I was already learning that, and I was not quite catching up because I didn't care. Um, so they said my math skills were bad, even though they were significantly advanced to the students that were my age in an American system. And they also said my English was good. But as you can imagine, if I'm going to a Japanese-speaking public school, their English classes are like first grade level, like basic stuff. I couldn't spell my middle name. I couldn't spell the word probably. I couldn't spell the word because my brother misspelled the word English on his application. So we had no idea what we were doing, but I was put in an advanced English class. But what I want to talk about real quick, just for a couple minutes, is some of the crazy things that happened in that remedial math class I was put apart in, of, uh, I was put in and was a part of, okay? So there were two students, they were from India, they were named Akashdeep and Puneet, and they were pretty special people. I remember one time my math teacher, Akashdeep had fallen behind in his homework, and so my math teacher asked him to turn in you know, multiple modules of homework at the same time. So he's like, okay, do you have 9.2? So he pulls out his notebook, gives it to the teacher, the teacher looks at it, grades it, put it in the grading system, flips the page, he's like, huh, I don't see 9.3. And he's like, oh, give me one sec. Takes his notebook, turns around, whips out a pen, scribbles out the two, puts a three, turns back the ho around and hands the teacher the homework that she'd graded five seconds ago, expecting that she wouldn't notice. So these are the kind of people I was in math class with. and. It's no wonder that they failed it a couple times. Um, but the story that sticks in my mind even more than that is the time Akashdeep was making fun of Puneet because Puneet got like, I think he got like a 47 or something in that class, and Akashdeep got like a 54. And in our school system, a 60 was a passing grade, but if you got between a 50 and a 60%, then instead of retaking the class, you could go to summer school and make it up in two weeks. And so Akashdeep, who had failed the class twice before, was making fun of Puneet because he did well enough, even though he failed the class, to make it into summer school. And that was something to brag about. And when I think about that, I remember back to me being in that class, and I never did my homework in that class. I never paid attention because I knew no matter how bad I did, I was honestly actually pretty good at math. And so it came naturally to me. And I knew that no matter how bad I did in that class, I was still going to be better than most of my classmates. And I think that in the same way, a lot of times as Christians, we look at the world around us, and it's pretty bad sometimes. And I feel like we look at all the terrible things that happen, and we feel pretty good about ourselves because most of our sins, most of our failures, are just completely dwarfed by the atrocities that we see happening in our world. And we fail to recognize, not that we don't know this for a fact, but we kind of escapes our minds and we think 
that you know our sins, or sorry, we forget that our sins, even if they're small in our eyes, are still big in God's eyes. Um, that God's standard is a lot higher than not just being completely awful. Um, but his standard is actually perfection. And when compared to it, like it says in Romans 3.23, uh, we all fall short. And when we get caught comparing ourselves not to God's standard, but when we get caught comparing ourselves to the world around us, a lot of times we start compromising on moral, just compromising morally and compromising on God's standards. And when we do that, um, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Um, and like me in that math class, we start being totally fine with our little sins, with our little problems, because they're not that big compared to the ones that we see in the world. Um, but today we're going to talk about um, why we need to live as Christians. We need to live a life free of moral compromise. And there are two main reasons we have to do that. The first reason we need to live a life free of moral... Sorry. I, can't, I cannot say that word to save my life, but... The reason we need to live a life free of moral compromise, first of all, is because um, moral compromise is a sin. It says in Deuteronomy 5.32, it's compared, God's commands and his standards are compared to a path. And it doesn't say, you know, walk next to the path. It doesn't say walk, you know, with an earshot. It says, be careful to follow it and don't turn to the left or to the right. So that's a clear command, following God's commands and not compromising uh, first of all, that's important because compromising is a sin. But the second reason, and this is what we're going to look at today, this is the focus of our story, is that moral compromise also has devastating effects. So if you guys could turn to Mark chapter 6, the story we're going to be looking at today is found in Mark chapter 6. And we're going to go 14 through 29, but if you could start off by turning to 17, uh, that's actually where we're going to start. And while we're turning there, I just want to give a quick explanation of the context of the story we're going to be talking about. So the Gospels start, you know, with Jesus being born and the things that happened early on in his life. And a couple of them have stories about him growing up. Uh, but the part we're looking at specifically here, Jesus has, begin, has begun his official uh, ministry. He's been, begun his official ministry. He's been preaching publicly. He's been doing miracles He's been teaching, and obviously because of how revolutionary his teaching is and how amazing the healing and miracles he's been doing are, um, he's becoming famous and people are hearing about him all over the place. And actually the story we're going to be looking at, specifically verses 17 through 29, are actually a flashback that are triggered um, in the mind of a man who's haunted by his moral compromises um, when he hears about Jesus and all the miracles uh, that he's doing. So I'm going to read verse 17 through 20, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Matthew, oh, sorry, not Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 6, starting verse 17. It said, For Herod himself had sent and had John arrested, it's John the Baptist, and bound, and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. So real quick, I just want to talk about who the main people in this passage are, because the family of Herod's is... a uh, it's rather complicated, there are a lot of them. So first of all, there's Herod the Great, who tried to kill baby Jesus. He had a bunch of wives, two of which even had the same name. And on top of that, in their family tree, there's a Herod Archelaus, a Herod Antipas, a Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II, Herod of Chalcaeus, Herodias, Herod Philip, and Philip. So when it's, the Bible says Herod said something, there are a lot of different options that it could possibly be. Um, but this is specifically Herod Antipas, who is the son of Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. And even though he will be referred to as a king in this passage, and he even says that he has a kingdom, uh, he actually doesn't. He is uh, he's the, basically the tetrarch of Galilee, who is in charge of the small region of Galilee. 
Um, and in this story, we find that Herod is living a life of moral compromise, and we're going to see the effects that it has on him. First of all, on one hand, there is Herod's fleshly desire. Um, Herod marries Herodias, and that's immoral for a number of reasons. First of all, they were both already married, um, so that was a problem, and they ended up divorcing the people they were married to in order to get married to each other. Um, on top of that, Herodias was not only his niece, but also his half-brother's wife, and there's no reason he wanted to marry her other than sinful lust. And so the Her Herod, marrying, Mar Herod marrying Herodias was a sinful thing. And so the, on one hand, we have that, but on the other hand, we have Herod's respect for John the Baptist and his respect for righteousness. And I think it's interesting that even when John the Baptist was in prison because of Herod and because of what he was doing with Herodias, even despite that, Herod still liked to go listen to him and hear what he had to say. And I find this, again, interesting because if John the Baptist was not going to shy away um, on telling Her Herod what he thought about and what God thought about his personal life and his relationships, I don't think that John the Baptist would have shied away from teaching other things either. And I'm sure that there are many things in Herod's life that didn't match up with God's word. Um, but despite that, Herod tried to do this balancing act where on one side he was fulfilling his whatever sinful desire he had, and on the other side he was trying to learn more about God and was trying to respect John because he was a holy person. And so this was bound to cause conflict in his life, and that's actually the first point I forgot to mention earlier, is that compromise causes conflict. Because um, on one side, first of all, it says in this passage, Herodias, his wife, wanted to kill John the Baptist. And so obviously, if he's revering and respecting John the Baptist and his wife wants to kill him, that's a problem. Um, and on the other side, it actually says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 5, it says at other times that Herod himself wanted to put him, that's John the Baptist, to death. And so I think that that's, I don't think that that's a contradiction in the Gospels. I think that at some times he did want to kill John because of what he was saying and how much it angered him. And at other times he wanted to protect him and listen to his teaching. Um, and so there's definitely that conflict there. And bringing it back to us nowadays, I think that if we as Christians would try to follow God and grow in our relationship with him, um, and hold on to sin, even if it's the small sins uh, relatively compared to the world. If we're trying to hold on to that sin and follow God at the same time, there's going to be that same conflict um, inside of us as well. So I guess my question to all of us, including myself, is are there any sins that we're holding on to that are causing that conflict where we're trying to grow in our relationship with God and it's not working because we're holding on to that sin? Um, another thing I th just wanted to note as we we're going along is that uh, even if we're not trying to hold on to sin, there's a certain level of this conflict that all of us as Christians are going to experience just from the fact that we are natural born sinners. And if we've trusted in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit um, living inside of us. It says, like Ron read earlier in Galatians 5.17, that the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, a sinful Nature sets its desire against the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that we will not do the things that we please. And so this conflict that we experience to a certain extent is always going to be there. But if we're trying to hold on to sin and follow God, um, it's going to make that conflict so much harder and so much worse. Um, so then moving on in that story, um, starting now in verse uh, 21, we see that we need to live a life free of moral compromise because compromise causes failure. It not only causes conflict, but moral compromise also causes failure. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 21, it says, A strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. So I want to stop there real quick and just point out a couple things. First of all, 
Herod's greatest failure, his greatest downfall was actually a setup. Um, and ironically, it was a setup by Herodias, his wife, who was the focus of his sinful compromise. I um, mean, there are a couple of reasons I believe that Herodias is the one who set this up, um, who basically set him up for his failure. The first is that in verse 21, it says it was a strategic day or an opportune time, depending on what your translation is. Um, some people believe that this was a strategic day or an opportune time for some kind of military or a political thing that Herod wanted to do. Um, but if we just look at what happens throughout the story, it's more likely that it's for Herodias. Um, secondly, verse 22 makes it clear by the wording where it says Herodias' daughter herself. Um, it makes it clear that what she was doing was not something that was typical of you know, Herod the Great's granddaughter, the daughter of a noble. Um, and so that makes it also seem like it was a setup. Also in verse 24 through 25, um, their response to what Herod is going to do, which we're going to look at, also makes it seem like it was a setup um, as well. And so I just want to bring this back to us again real quick, and that is that when we're compromising morally, it gives our enemy a foothold. It says in Ephesians chapter of 4, verses 26 and 27, and this is specifically talking about anger, but could be applied to any sin in our life. Um, it says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And if you do not, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Because um, the reality is there are people uh, who, there's both Satan who's looking for an opportunity for us to stumble. But there are also people in our lives, especially if we are Christians and we're outspoken about that and they're not a huge fan of that. There will also be people in our lives who are looking for us to stumble um, both to make it happen and pounce on the opportunity to let everybody know about it when we do. Um, I remember I was working at Walmart. This was uh, a while ago. Uh, I was probably, it was probably after my first year in uh, Bible college, and everybody knew that I was from the Bible college, right? They knew that you know, I was going to be a pastor, and every time I made any kind of mistake, uh, I had a coworker who was not a huge fan of Christians, <laughs> And any mistake I made was immediately a deliberate thing that I did that was terrible. I remember one time they asked, like, oh, did you take care of this? And I had been up until I was closing the night before and was opening the next day. And I was sleep deprived. And so I was like, yeah, I think I did because I had done it the last day. And I was just, and so then I came back like three minutes later. I was like, actually, I did that yesterday. I don't think I did. And I took care of it. But, you know, everyone then found out that I was lying about all the work that I'd been doing. Or other times, I'd just be standing there for like five seconds zoned out. And even though she was on her phone, you know, everyone was like, oh, yeah, he's lazy and he's not doing anything. And the reality is, if people don't like God, if they're not huge fans of him, there will be people out there who are waiting for us to trip up as well. Um, so we have to be aware of that. Uh, so first, we see the setup for Herod's fall year. The sec secondly, we see the failure itself. If you look in verse 22 again, um, verse 22, um, Herod then says, ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And this, again, like I said, Herod didn't have a kingdom. This would have been a figure of speech um, of their time. And it was basically just saying, ask for anything and I'll give it to you. And she went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. Um, and so here we see Herod's fall. And one thing I think is interesting is we never really know when the compromises we're making in our lives are going to come back to bite us. I think if we did, we'd probably stop them before they did. And when our sin does come back to bite us, whatever pleasure we got out of it, whatever comfort, whatever ease, whatever, whatever we were looking for, we got out of it. Um, it's immediately overshadowed by guilt 
and pain and isn't really worth it. And that's what we see in this passage, specifically in verse 26. Um, those words, very sorry, especially if you're talking to toddlers, means sometimes nothing. But when the Bible says that Herod was very sorry, it meant that he was overwhelmed by sorrow because he recognized how terrible the consequences of his actions were actually going to be. And so then going on, we see the result of his failure, and that's in verse 27 through 29, where it says, Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard about this, they came and took his body away and laid it in a tomb. And I just am imagining what it would be like to be Herod um, in that moment, um, sitting there, his party, even though everyone else might have still be in, been enjoying it, uh, completely ruined for him. And just, I, I'm sure that the image that was stuck in his mind probably never would have left him uh, for the rest of your life. And I was actually, Looking up a quote, and it's kind of ironic now, but uh, there's a great quote about sin, and it says, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep, or, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. I think if we knew the consequences of our sins when we started them, the consequences of our compromises, we probably wouldn't make them. And ironically, that quote, as I was looking up, is actually by... Uh, Ravi Zacharias, and so um, it's true, sin does keep us, uh, does take us further than we want to go, keep us longer than we want to stay, and cost us more than we want to pay. And what this really boils down to, I think one lesson we can learn from this story, is that sin and righteousness can't coexist, and if we try to make them, eventually one of them in our lives is going to get rid of the other, either sin getting rid of our pursuit of God or our pursuit of God, not completely eradicating our sin, but kind of pushing that desire to sin um, at least partially out of our lives. And I think here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 14, it says, and this is specifically talking about being unequally yoked with um, unbelievers, but it says, do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, right? Light and dark don't coexist, sin and righteousness can't coexist, and we can't try and make them coexist in our lives. It also says in Matthew 6, uh, verse 24, this is specifically talking about money, but in Matthew 6, uh, verse 24, Oops. There you go. Matthew 6, 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And the reality is we can't serve ourselves or any of our futile desires and God. We can't serve them both. It's impossible. Um, so just applying this to our lives again, we have to be careful of the situations we put ourselves in. Uh, Herod put himself in a bad situation, um, and that's one of the reasons he fell. And also, we can't, you know, try and hold on to sin and follow God and uh, expect it to work either. And then lastly, the last devastating effect that moral compromise can have on our lives is that moral compromise, um, it causes regret. And the regret that we see in the life of uh, Herod is actually pretty... Um, Pretty astounding. So back in Mark chapter 6, I'm now going to go back to verse 7, uh, sorry, sorry, 14 through 17, 14 through 16. Um, because like I said, this is all a flashback, and we're going to read what that flashback looked like for Herod. It says, starting in verse 10, verse 14, and King Herod heard of it. Specifically, he heard of the miracles that Jesus was doing. He heard of all the teaching that he was doing. He heard of all the healing he was accomplished. And when King Herod heard of it, 
um, and heard that his name had become well known and the people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. And it says others were saying it is Elijah and others were saying he is a prophet like the prophets of old. But when King Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John who I am beheaded has risen. Um, and there are a couple of reasons it doesn't make any sense to believe that John the Baptist uh, had risen again, first of all. Um, he believed it was some kind of like, you know, reincarnation type thing. And Jesus and John were contemporaries, and Jesus was doing miracles before John was beheaded. Um, so this makes no logical sense, but the image that was stuck in Herod's mind and the fact that John the Baptist dying was a consequence of his sin um, kind of haunted him beyond the logic of the whole situation. And to a much lesser extent, I remember in my life, I was younger and I was a, uh, I was one of those kids who liked to play with everything that was, uh, I don't know, I liked to try and be athletic and cool. And so I played all the sports and if there was a stick, I picked it up, whether I was, you know, hitting home runs or killing things with my lightsaber. Um, I like to play with sticks, and basically I like to play with rocks. I like to play with anything that I could throw or swing. Um, and there was one time I, was, I had this stick and I was waving it around, and my mom came over and told me that I had to stop swinging that stick around because if I kept swinging the stick around, I was going to hurt someone, poke someone in the eye. And I was like, okay, got it. So then I moved further away from everyone, kept swinging the stick around, and just slowly but surely, you know, kept swinging the stick closer and closer until eventually I did actually stab a kid in the eye with my stick. And I, to this day, can still remember exactly what his bloodshot eye looked like. I remember exactly where in the campgrounds I was waiting for him to come back to the ER, so I had to apologize. And that, that image is definitely stuck in my head. And I can imagine the same image only 10 times thousands of times worse was stuck in Herod's mind and that's why he's so haunted by the death of John the Baptist and so obviously the application of this whole passage is to focus not on the sins of the world but focus on God's standard and not compromise on those morals but just for all of us who maybe like Herod we're already haunted by something that we've done in the past. If you're anything like me, there are definitely things you've done that you regret and probably won't actually end up forgetting. Um, but ironically, Jesus, the one who Herod was so afraid of, was actually the key to overcoming this terrible guilt that he was feeling. Because whether we've done, you know, great sins or whether we've done little sins in our minds, um, just simply told a lie or something, the reality is we've all failed compared to God's perfect standard, right? Romans 3.23 makes it clear that co when compared to the glory of God, all of us fall short. Um, but despite that, like it says in Romans 5.8, God still loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us, and we can all have forgiveness from that sin, um, regardless of how big or how small it is. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, that... In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption. Through his blood, we have the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And so if we have done things that we greatly regret, we don't have to be haunted like Herod was. Um, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if we're in Christ, right, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away and the new things have come. It's like it's a different person. If we've done all these terrible things before we got saved and now we're saved, and it's like we're a new person. Um, but if you're like me, again, you're like, well, most of the things that I did that I really regret happened to me after I was saved. I was saved at a young age, um, but I definitely did some things I regretted after that. Well, in 1 John 1, 9, it makes it clear that if we confess our sins, right, if we admit that what we did is wrong, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful to his promise, and the reason he's just and he's righteous in forgiving us our sins is because Jesus already paid for them, right? If Jesus already paid for the sins, then we can't be punished for them because Jesus already took that punishment. So 
he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Um, And that's not to say that we as Christians, we don't lose our salvation when we sin. We simply lose our fellowship. Our fellowship with God is broken in the same way. If we wronged anyone else here on this earth, if we wronged them, then our fellowship with that person will be broken until we admit that and ask for forgiveness and apologize. And it's just the same way with God. Um, And so I guess my encouragement to anyone who might be struggling with a sin that they committed in the past is just, God has already forgiven us if we've asked our forgiveness, if we've um, trusted in him for our salvation. God's already forgiven us, and sometimes it's a lot harder to forgive ourselves than it is for God to forgive us. Um, Yeah, so I guess just in closing, what I wanted to say again is that we need to live a life free of moral compromise. First of all, because it causes conflict in our lives if we're trying to hold on to sin and follow God at the same time, uh, it's not going to work. Um, and it also causes failure, so we have to be careful and alert of the situations we put ourselves in. Um, it also causes regret, but that feeling of guilt doesn't have to be something we hold on to forever. We can accept God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And so my final encouragement to all of us, including myself definitely, is that when we see all this stuff that's happening in the world, not to focus on that as our standard, but to look in God's word and focus on God's standard and try and follow um, him and not make these moral compromises that a lot of times lead us much further than we wish we would go. So thank you for letting me share. I'm going to pray and then I think we're dismissed. Or there's a song. Yes. Okay. Dear God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that, again, like I said earlier, you haven't left us... uh, to wander around living our lives not knowing how we should live them. And you've given us all these uh, commands and guidelines that really are wonderful and help us to uh, live life in a way that honors you. And I pray that we'd follow those and not compromise on them because we see other people in our lives compromising on them. And I just pray again that uh, also when we do sin that we would accept your forgiveness and realize how much you truly love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may stand if you like, but we are going to dismiss with the chorus of This is Amazing Grace.